So we're on our third message or so in this series called The Human Journey. And it's a little bit different. It's a sort of message for people who don't come to church. So it's not the sort of thing you hear in church usually. But it may be helpful for some people. It kind of tries to look at some of the things that we don't really talk about when we go through the Bible and teach about how does the Bible and the scripture relate to the world around us and all of these questions that come up in modern life. So I call it the human journey because we're going to talk about a lot of different things from the, the ancient past and even on to the future and different kinds of things. And we're just going to have some fun. And today's message in this series is called 300 Sextillion Stars. Now I know all of you probably know this, but for anybody who doesn't, you know, uh, Sextillion uh, comes after, you know, uh, quintillion, which comes after quadrillion, and then we get back to trillion. So you can always remember, you know, it's a million, a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion, a quintillion, a sextillion, a septillion, a octillion, a nonillion, and a decillion. And those are really handy words to know and drop into everyday conversation and confuse people. <laughs> <laughs> For more scientific minds, it's uh, three times 10 to the 23rd power, which might be a little bit easier. And it looks like this. Here's that number, you know, written out. And this is the number of stars that scientists currently estimate are in our universe. And that's just a few of them there. That's called a flock of stars there, kind of a nice little touch. You know, this was a photo taken by the Hubble telescope. And we see these things, you know, now, now and then in the news, and some people are really into looking at all the latest photos from space, and it's a lot of fun to see what's out there. And this has become popular ever since the Hubble telescope went up, because the Hubble telescope is giving us uh, photographs of the galaxies and of the stars that are just far superior to anything that we had before the Hubble telescope. So it's really become a matter of interest for a lot of people to look and say, hey, what's in the news? What, is the, what have they found? You know? And so you may have seen this picture. This is a galaxy M106. It's really, really pretty. So it shows up in news reports sometimes and science fiction films. <laughs> and this is a galaxy pair. These two galaxies are sort of close together. You know, they're neighbors, although it's a really huge distance between them. And our galaxy, they estimate, has 100 billion stars in it. And there are billions and billions of galaxies. And that's where you get that number, you know, the sextillion number. It's just there's so many. Then there's other things. This is a nebula. It's like a big cloud in space, you know, really wild. And people who watch science fiction shows have probably seen the starship go into the nebula to hide from the enemy because the sensors don't work and things like that, you know. Well, can you do that? I don't know. You know, maybe someday we'll find out. <laughs> and closer to home, you know, back in our little neighborhood, we have Mars. We're learning a lot more about Mars than we used to. Uh, this ship here is the Mars Express. It's orbiting Mars now. Uh, it's uh, put up by the European Space Agency. You know, the United States is not the only player in this. They may be the biggest players still. But there are a lot of countries now, including Japan, that are putting satellites up and they're getting into going out and looking at the universe and learning about it. Uh, and some of them share everything they learn and some of them share only pieces. Like the Chinese have the first lander on what's called the dark side of the moon, the far side of the moon. And they're sharing some things, but I doubt they will share all of their data about that. They'll probably keep some things just for their Chinese scientists. Well, recently, the Mars Express, uh, not long ago, made a really uh, fascinating discovery, and it's really amazing. They took this picture of a crater of ice on Mars. You know, we don't have pictures of all of the surface of Mars up close. Uh, we have some sort of big scale pictures. But this is a picture that shows that there really is a crater here on Mars that has a huge uh, lake of ice, frozen lake in it. You know, and this is a pretty big thing because they've known for a few years that there's some water on Mars, but this is the first thing that shows that there's a big enough water supply to provide water for like a colony or something. Clearly, this is big enough to provide water for a city, you know, at least for a long time. Uh, so 
we may really see some of these ideas, you know, about putting colonies on Mars someday may be coming true. And we'll probably see people landing on Mars in the not so distant future, probably just a few more years. Uh, depending on whose schedule you believe, it might be less than five years. But more realistically, it's probably going to be just a little bit more. And of course, uh, the Hubble telescope was the first one that was taking really good pictures of deep space. And, uh, and there's other pictures of Mars and the other planets. But there's actually not one or two or three. There are uh, dozens of sensors up now, radio telescopes and uh, vi telescopes in our uh, visible range that we can see. And we're getting lots and lots of data that we never had before. Now, by the way, uh, I just might mention while this is up here, this, this here is the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum, and on here it shows from gamma ray going down to radio waves, what you listen to on your radio at home, if you have an old AM radio or FM radio. But the part that we can see with the human eyeball is just this little bitty part in the middle is visible light. So now and then, and I know people are just, you know, using hyperbole when they see it, but every now and then somebody will say, well, I only believe in things I can see. If I can't see it, I don't believe it. Seeing is believing. Well, that's an interesting statement because it means that you believe in only a tiny, tiny percent of the things out there. Because the majority of things you cannot see with the human eye. Most of the things around you, even right here in the room, you cannot see with the human eye. When we come to the electromagnetic spectrum, you can see only this little tiny slice and that's it. The human eyeball is a highly specialized sensor that sees a certain type of objects and a certain type of things. Now, of course, physical objects we can see pretty well, things that are solid. But things that are electromagnetic signals and things we can't see. We see the effects of gravity, but we can't see gravity. That's a whole other category of things. But now we have all of these sensors out here, and we're seeing data for deep space, for the galaxy, the universe, across a wide spectrum of electromagnetic frequencies. Now, there in the middle, you can kind of see there's this guy called Kepler. Kepler is kind of a hero recently in a lot of stories, even though Kepler just retired a little bit ago. Kepler was on a nine-year mission to photograph stars and look for other planets around stars. And you may have seen something in the news from time to time. They found a new planet, and is it like Earth in some sense, the same size of Earth, or is it like Jupiter, you know, a lot bigger? You know, does it possibly have water out there on some of these other planets? Well, Kepler was the first uh, space telescope put up specifically to look for other planets, and it found a bunch of them. So it's not the only planet hunting telescope now, uh, but there's been, it was the first one dedicated to that mission and it found a lot. And we have found and identified more than 3,500 exoplanets, we call them. Planets that orbit other stars besides our sun. And we've only just begun to look. So we're going to find, you know, maybe sextillions of planets too. We're gonna find huge numbers of planets out there. We don't know how many, maybe not that many. Uh, maybe only a quintillion, <laughs> but a lot of planets are out there. And now we have some more sensors looking for them. This is pretty interesting. This is a star directly photographed by the Keck Observatory over time, and you can identify four planets moving around this star. So this is one of the very few directly imaged planet, uh, exoplanet systems that you can actually see visual images. Most of them, they only find images that are outside the wavelengths the human eye can see. But here, you know, we've got a model. Here's a, a star in the middle, represented by the star, and planets going around it. They have to black out the brightness of the star, or they wouldn't actually be able to see the planets, because it's too bright. That was taken from Keck Observatory. And of course, you know, this discovery of other planets, and we even have some indication some of these planets out there and other systems have water. We know Mars has water, Earth has water. Water may be much more common across the galaxy, across the universe, uh, than some people imagine. There may be a lot of water. And everything we know about life indicates that water is one of the things you have to have to have life. 
You know, there may be forms of life that don't use water, but the life forms we know all use water. You know, it's science fiction completely to talk about silicone-based life or something. So, obviously, the implications of finding all these planets, finding more water, is the issue of whether there are other alien beings out there, extraterrestrial intelligence, has gotten even hotter than before. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence has become very exciting to a lot of people because suddenly they got all these planets to look at. Before, all they could do was just look up at the big sky and I wonder if anything's out there, you know, and, and pick stars more or less at random looking to see if they could see some sort of signal maybe that was produced by intelligent beings. Now they can point at planets that they know there are planets there. They can point at stars that they know have planets and look. So, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, is it out there? Can we find it? If we find it, what does it mean? What will we do about it? Do we care? You know, they're so far away. A lot of questions in that. Will we ever get to meet them, you know, if they're so far away? Uh, how can we get there? How can they come here? Some of our scientists say we shouldn't be looking for them. We should be hiding from them because they're probably going to be hostile and eat us all, you know, or destroy our planet or steal all of our resources. Other people say, no, they're probably friendly. You know, we can have some friends out there in the uh, galaxy. This is the Allen Telescope Array. Uh, it's dedicated entirely as its main mission, its job is to look for extraterrestrial intelligence. They abbreviated ATA, so a lot of people call it the Alien Telescope Array. They forget that the name is actually Allen and they <laughs> look at, oh, Alien Telescope Array. Now it's the Allen Array and it's out there looking, you know, in the 500 to 10,000 megahertz band. 500 uh, hertz to uh, 500 megahertz to 10 gigahertz band of radio waves to see if they can find anybody else sending radio waves in what we would call the, the radio, the TV spectrum out there. Anybody else out there watching the Brady Bunch, you know, on TV at night or something like that. Uh, so this is a really cool picture, so I put it in. This picture is just for fun, really. This is what the Allen Telescope Array looks like at night. Uh, because it's looking in the radio spectrum, not in the visual spectrum, they look all day, 24 hours. They don't need to wait for night to do that, to continue their search. But uh, the things that the Allen Telescope Array sees cannot be seen by human eyes, and the things we see, this array cannot see. Different uh, band of the frequency spectrum, completely different outside of our ability to detect with the eyeball. So at any rate, this search is heating up and going on and we're finding so many stars, so many planets, so many questions out there. What does it all mean? You know, and I'm a Christian. That's, that's my identity. Uh, I believe in God and I believe in God as the creator. And for me, all of this just shows clearly how big God's creation is and it makes God seem even more amazing and magnificent the more I learn. Here's a verse from Isaiah chapter 40. It says, lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls them each by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. That's an amazing idea that God has actually named uh, all of these stars. You know, they all have names. The planets have names. You have names and God knows them. And the Bible tells us God knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows everything about you. So our God in the Bible is, is pretty amazing. But he's not just our God. He's the God of the entire universe. You know, and most religious ideas and things are, are regional. They're like the God of this area or the God of this land or the God of this city. But the Bible isn't like that, even though so much of the Bible is focused on the story of Israel. From the beginning to the end of the Bible, again and again, it reminds us that God is the God of the entire universe. He's not just a God of one country or one people or even one planet. He's the God, period, everywhere, all the time. And that makes us wonder, well, why does God care about us? You know, <laughs> we're so tiny. Our planet is just a little tiny speck of dust in this galaxy, let alone in the universe. 
But the Bible tells us God does care. But here's the psalmist in Psalm 80 saying, you know, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? And man, of course, here is mankind, you know. Why does God care about human beings and about each and single human being? Not just the whole collection of them, but every single one of them. Well, God loves us and he cares about us. And I guess because he made us, he's connected to us in the way that he's our creator. So he cares about what he made. Uh, however you want to look at it, the Bible's very clear that God knows and cares about every single person and every single thing in his creation. So if there are other intelligent creatures out there, extra intelligent, extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, alien beings out there, God made them too. And he's their God too, whether they know it or not. And so really, it doesn't affect a Christian faith very much, whether there are millions of alien civilizations out there or whether we're all alone. There might be some Christians and even some pastors and teachers who say, no, we have to be all alone because the Bible makes us very special. Yeah, the Bible does make us very special here on earth, but the Bible is a message to the people of earth. If God has other alien beings out there that he created, that he cares about and he loves, he probably gave them messages too. So we shouldn't get all uh, arrogant to think we can be the only ones because the Bible talks about us and doesn't mention aliens, why would it? It was written, you know, thousands of years ago for people who didn't even think about whether there were aliens on other stars because they didn't realize those stars were just like our sun and they might have planets. So it really doesn't change the Christian faith, this question of aliens out there. It really doesn't. Uh, it may change our interpretation of some Bible verses. It may change some of our pieces of theology. You know, somebody might ask, you know, well, what in the Bible would change if there, we meet uh, aliens out there, you know, whether it's uh, people like Spock, you know, from Star Trek, or whether it's terrible monsters, you know, from one of these horror flicks. What would change in the Bible? Well, Nothing changes in the Bible if that happens. There might be some places we might kind of look again and reinterpret. This is one that occurs to me is John 10, 16. Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Well, the Bible calls us people sheep. You know, that's because we sometimes aren't so clever. That's a different message for a different day. But the Bible calls us sheep, and he's speaking of, you know, there in the context. Here's the people of Israel, the, the Jews, and he's speaking in that context to them, and he's telling them, I have other sheep. So traditionally, this verse is interpreted as meaning all the other nations besides Israel. And that certainly is the meaning of this verse. But if we meet aliens from other planets, no doubt we will expand the interpretation of this verse to include them as another pen, different sheep, same God, same Jesus Christ. And we don't know how he would reveal himself to them, but God can figure that out. We don't have to figure that out. God knows what he's doing. So Jesus is our savior and he remains our savior. He remains God, regardless of whether there are other aliens or not. And the God of the Bible is the same God of all of these other creatures out there if they're out there. Jesus says in Revelation 22, 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Well, if you got the beginning and you got the end, you've got everything in between. So the entire universe, no matter how many sextillion stars are out there, it's all in God's hands. And we can trust that he knows what he's doing and that he cares about each and every little speck of dust and certainly every being out there. So thank you. God bless you. Let's say a quick word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just give thanks to you that you are not a, a small local God of, of a city or even of a country. You are God of all, of the entire universe. And every single star, every single planet, every single creature that might be out there, we don't know if they're there or not, but if they are, they belong to you. 
They're part of your creation and you made them. Thank you that even though the universe is vast and we are so small on our little blue marble here, thank you that you care about us and that you love us and that you provided a way of salvation for us through Jesus Christ. And just ask that you would lead and guide us all to know Christ, to trust in him, to walk with him. Bless each and every one in Jesus' name. Amen.